continuing with Harper Lee's wonderful book, To Kill a Mockingbird. This is chapter 10. Atticus was feeble. He was nearly 50 when Jim and I asked him why he was so old. He said he got started late, which we felt reflected upon his abilities and manliness. He was much older than the parents of our school contemporaries, and there was nothing Jim or I could say about it when our classmates said, my father. Jim was football crazy. Atticus was never too tired to play keep away, but when Jim wanted to tackle him, Atticus would say, I'm too old for that, son. Our father didn't do anything. He worked in an office, not in a drugstore. Atticus did not drive a dump truck for the county. He was not the sheriff. He did not farm, work in a garage, or do anything that could possibly arouse the admiration of anyone. Besides that, he wore glasses. He was nearly blind in his left eye and said left eyes were the tribal curse of the finches. Whenever we want, he wanted to see something well, he turned his head and looked from his right eye. He did not do the things his schoolmates' fathers did. He never went hunting. He did not play poker or fish or drink or smoke. He sat in the living room and read. With these attributes, attributes, however, he would not remain as inconspicuous as we wished him to. That year, the school buzz would talk about him defending Tom Robinson, none of which was complimentary. After my bout with Cecil, Jacobs, when I committed myself to a policy of cowardice, word got round that Scott Finch wouldn't fight anymore. Her daddy wouldn't let her. This was not entirely correct. I would fight publicly for Atticus, but the family was private ground. I would fight anyone from a third cousin upwards, tooth and nail. Francis Hancock, for example, knew that. When he gave an us our air rifles, Atticus wouldn't teach us to shoot. Uncle Jack instructed us in the rudiments thereof. He said Atticus wasn't interested in guns. Atticus said to Jim one day, I'd rather you shoot at tin cans in the backyard, but I know you'll go after birds. Shoot all the blue jays you want, if you can hit them. But remember, it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. That was the only time I ever heard Atticus say it was a sin to do something, and I asked Miss Maudie about it. Your father's right, she said. Mockingbirds don't do one thing but make music for us to enjoy. They don't eat up people's gardens, don't nest in poor cribs. They don't do one thing but sing their hearts out for us. That's why it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. Miss Maudie, this is an old neighborhood, ain't it? Been here longer than the town. No, I mean the folks on here are old. Jim and me's the only children around here. Mrs. Du Bois is close to a hundred, and Mrs. Rachel's old, and so are you and Atticus. I don't call fifty very old, said Miss Maudley tartly. Not being wheeled around yet, am I? Neither's your father. But I must say, Providence was kind enough to burn down that old mausoleum of mine. I'm too old to keep it up. Maybe you're right, Jean Louise. This is a settled neighborhood. You've never been around young folks much, have you? Yes, I'm at school. I mean, young grown-ups. You're lucky, you know. You and Jim have the benefit of your father's age. If your father was 30, you'd find life quite different. I sure would, Atticus. Can't do anything. You'd be surprised, said Miss Monty. There's life in him yet. What can he do? Well, he can make somebody's will so airtight, can't make anybody meddle with it. Shoot. Well, did you know he's the best checker player in this town? Why, down at the landing when we were coming up, Atticus Finch could beat everybody on both sides of the river. Good Lord, Miss Monty, Jim and me beat him all the time. It's about time you found out because he lets you. Did you know he can play a Jew's harp? The modest accomplishment served to make me even more ashamed of him. Well, she said. Well, what, Miss Monty? Well, nothing, nothing. It seems with all that you'd be proud of him. Can't everybody play a Jew's harp? Now keep out of the way of the carpenters. You better go home. I'll be in my azaleas and can't watch you. Plank might hate you. I went to the backyard and found Jim plugging away at a tin can, which seemed stupid with all the blue jays around. I returned to the front yard and busied myself for two hours erecting a complicated breastwork at the side of the porch, consisting of a tire, an orange crate, the laundry hamper, the porch chairs, and a small U.S. flag Jim gave me from a pork popcorn box. When Atticus came home to dinner, he found me crouched down, aiming across the street. What are you shooting at him? Miss Maudie's rear end. Atticus turned and saw my generous target bending over her bushes. He pushed his hat back to his head and crossed the street. Maudie, he said, I thought I'd better warn you, you're in considerable peril. Miss Maudie straightened up and looked toward me. She said, Atticus, you are a devil from hell. When Atticus returned, he told me to break camp. Don't you ever let me catch you pointing that gun at anybody again, he said. I wish my father was a devil from hell. I sounded out called Bernie on the subject. Mr. Finch, why, he can't do lots of things. He can do lots of things. Like what? I asked. Calpurnia scratched her head. Well, I don't know rightly now, she said. 
Jim underlined it when he asked Atticus if he was going out for the Methodists, and Atticus said he'd break his neck if he did. He was just too old for that sort of thing. The Methodists were trying to pay off their church mortgage and had challenged the Baptists to a game of touch football. Everybody in town's father was playing, it seemed, except Atticus. Jim said he didn't want to go, but he was unable to resist football in any form, and he stood gloomily on the sidelines with Atticus and me watching Cecil Jacob's father make touchdowns for the Baptists. One Saturday, Jim and I decided to go exploring with our air rifles to see if we could find a rabbit or a squirrel. We had gone about 500 yards beyond the Radley place when I noticed Jim squinting at something down the street. He had turned his head to one side and was looking out of the corners of his eyes. What you looking at? That old dog down yonder, he said. That's old Tim Johnson, ain't it? Yeah. Tim Johnson was the property of Mr. Harry Johnson, who drove the Mobile bus and lived on the southern edge of town. Tim was a liver-covered bird dog, the pet of Macon. What's he doing? I don't know, Scout. Well, we better go home. Oh, Jim, it's February. I don't care. I'm going to tell Cal. We rushed up home and ran to the kitchen. Cal said, Jim, can you down to the sidewalk a minute? What for, Jim? I can't come down the sidewalk every time you want me. There's something wrong with an old dog down yonder. Calpurnia side. I can't wrap up any dog's foot now. There's some gauze in the bathroom, so get it and do it yourself. Jim shook his head. He's sick, Cal. Something's wrong with him. What's he doing? Trying to catch his tail? No, he's doing like this. Jim gulped like a goldfish, hunched his shoulders, and twitched his torso. He's going like that, only like like he means to. Are you telling me a story, Jim Fitch? Calpurnia's voice hardened. No, Cal, I swear I'm not. Was he running? No, he's just moseying along, so slow you can't hardly tell. He's just coming this way. Calpurnia rinsed her hands and followed Jim to the yard. I don't see any dogs, she said. She followed us beyond the Radley place and looked where Jim pointed. Tim Johnson was not much more than a speck in the distance, but he was closer to us. He walked erratically, as if his right legs were shorter than his left. He reminded me of a car stuck in a sandbag. He's gone lopsided, said Jim. Calpurnia stared, then grabbed us by the shoulders and ran us home. She shut the wood door behind us, went to the telephone, and shouted, Give me Mr. Finch's office. Mr. Finch, she shouted, this is Cal. I swear to God, there's a mad dog down the street apiece. He's coming this way. Yes, sir, he is, Mr. Finch. I declare he is. Old Tim Johnson. Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes. She hung up and shook her head when we tried to ask her what Atticus had said. She rattled the telephone hook and said, Miss Ulamay, now, ma'am, I'm talking to Mr. Finch. Please don't connect me no more. Listen, Miss Ulamay, can you call Miss Rachel and Miss Stephanie Crawford and whoever's got a phone on the street and tell them a mad dog's a-coming? Please, ma'am. Calpurnia listed. I know it's February, Miss Ulamay, but I know a mad dog when I see one. Please, ma'am, hurry. Calpurnia asked Jim, Bradley's got a phone? Jim looked in the phone book. Jim looked in the book and said, no. They won't come out anyway, Cal. I don't care. I'm going to tell him. She ran to the front porch, Jim and I at her heels. You stay at that house, she yelled. Calpurnia's message had been received by the neighborhood. Every wood door within our range of vision was closed tight. We saw no trace of Jim, Tim Johnson. That's the dog. We watched Calpurnia running toward the Radley place, holding her skirt and apron above her knees. She went up to the front steps and banged on the door. She got no answer, and she shouted, Mr. Nathan, Mr. Arthur, mad dogs are coming, mad dogs coming. She's, she's supposed to go around and back, I said. Jim shook his head. Don't make any difference now, he said. Calpurnia pounded on the door in vain. No one acknowledged her warning. No one seemed to have heard it. As Calpurnia sprinted to the back porch, a Ford swung into the driveway. Atticus and Mr. Heck Tate got out. Mr. Heck Tate was the sheriff of Macon County. He was as tall as Atticus, but thinner. He was a long-nosed, wore boots with shiny metal eye holes, book pants, and a lumber jacket. His belt had a row of bullets sticking in it. He carried a heavy rifle. When he and Atticus reached the porch, Jim opened the door. Stay inside, son, said Atticus. Where is he? Cal. He ought to be here by now, said Calpurnia, pointing down the street. Not running, is he? asked Mr. Tate. No, sir, he's in the twitching stage, Mr. Heck. Should we go after him, Peck? asked Atticus. We better wait, Mr. Finch. They usually go in a straight line, but you never can tell. He might follow the curb. Hope he does, or he'll go straight to the Radley backyard. Let's wait a minute. Don't think he'll get to the Radley's yard, said Atticus. Fence will stop him. He'll probably follow the road. I thought mad dogs foamed at the mouth, galloped, leaped, and lunged at throats, and I thought they did it in August. Had Tim Johnson behaved thus, I would have been less frightened. Nothing is more deadly than a deserted, waiting street. The trees were still. The mockingbirds were silent. The carpenters at Miss Maudie's house had vanished. I heard Mr. Tate sniff and blow his nose. I saw him shift his gun in the crook of his arm. I saw Miss Stephanie Crawford's face framed in the glass window of her front door. Miss Maudie appeared and stood beside her. Atticus put his foot on the rung of a chair and rubbed his hand slowly down the side of his thigh. There he is, he said softly. Tim Johnson, the dog, came into sight 
walking dazzily in the inner rim of the curved parallel to the Radley house. Look at him, whispered Jim. Mr. Hex said they'll walk in a straight line. He can't even stay in the road. He looks more sick than anything, I said. Let anything get in front of him and he'll come straight at it. Mr. Tate put his hands on his forehead and leaned forward. He's got it all right, Mr. Finch. Tim Johnson was advancing at a snail's, place, a snail's pace, but it was not playing or sniffing at foliage. He seemed dedicated to one course and motivated by an invisible force that was itching him toward us. We could see him shiver like a horse shedding flies, his jaw open and shut. He was a list, but he was being pulled gradually toward us. He's looking for a place to die, said Jim. Mr. Tate turned around. He's far from dead, Jim. He hasn't gotten started yet. Tim Johnson reached the side street that ran in front of the Radley place, and what remained of his poor mind made him pause and seem to consider which road he would take. He made a few hesitant steps and stopped in front of the Radley gate. Then he tried to turn around but was having difficulty. Atticus said, He's within range. Heck, you better get him before he goes down the side street. Lord knows who's around the corner. Go inside, Cal. Calpurnia opened the screen door, latched it 